From Toronto, Canada, The Conspiracy Show with Richard Serrett. Hello and welcome, friends, to the program. Hello to our friends in the Hudson Valley, in the great Empire State, New York, down in Asheville, North Carolina, Birmingham, Alabama, Huntsville, of course, Thunder Bay, down to the Carolinas, all listening in tonight to the program. We've got a good one for you. In just a few moments, we'll be joined on the line by someone who probably knew Jim Morrison, the legendary a poet, uh, probably, I would argue, the most charismatic singer, frontman for a rock band uh, in the history of uh, rock and roll. Uh, Jim Morrison's uh, former brother-in-law, brother-in-law will be here in uh, just a few moments. Uh, it seems everybody uh, is writing a book about the life and death of Jim Morrison, uh, but I think tonight we're going to get the straight goods from someone who knew him better than probably even his bandmates, uh, who've also written books and theorized as to what happened to Jim uh, back in uh, 1971 in Paris. We've all heard the rumors and the legends, but uh, Alan Graham is going to set the record straight here in just a moment. Uh, some interesting stories, though, I wanted to bring to your attention, and I've posted them to my website at richardserrett.com if you'd like to... Uh, uh, to read more in depth, but let me just uh, let me tease you a little bit. Star Trek fans, of course, are all familiar with the term warp drive and uh, the idea that you know the uh, the Enterprise could could travel faster uh, than the speed of light exponentially, right? Uh, warp drive would be the speed of light, and then many times more than that. Uh, Scotty would be saying, you know, I, it, the engines can't take it, Captain. <laughs> anyway, now scientists are saying warp drive. Again, the ability to achieve faster than light travel uh, may not be as unrealistic as once thought. A warp drive would manipulate space-time itself to move a starship, taking advantage of a loophole in the laws of physics that prevent anything from moving faster than light. I love that they're going to they're going to it's like they have clubhouse lawyers. Uh, that are going to take advantage of a loophole. This is not Revenue Canada or the IRS, folks. I don't know how you take advantage of a loophole. Uh, nonetheless, uh, a concept for a real-life warp drive was suggested in 1994 by a Mexican physicist, Miguel Alcubierre. Uh, however, subsequent calculations found that such a device would require prohibitive amounts of energy. Well, I guess so. Well, now physicists say that adjustments can be made to the proposed warp drive that would enable it to run on significantly less energy, potentially bringing the idea back from the realm of science fiction into science. And very quickly, this is an amazing story. Uh, A lost fisherman who drifted at sea for 15 weeks. For part of that time, he slept next to his dead brother-in-law and was eventually helped to safety, he says, by a shark. A Takai... A tatoy was struck on a, or was stuck rather on a 15 foot wooden boat for more than 100 days, uh, after, uh, he ran out of fuel and the vessel drifted into the Pacific. Uh, the, um, a policeman, uh, in the case, relie- um, he was a policeman. He re- relieved his harrowing voyage after a fishing boat eventually picked him up and took him to Majuro in the Marshall Islands. And the father of six, uh, told of sleeping with the body of his brother-in-law who died during the ordeal. He later buried him at sea. Um, Now, what happened, though, after dehydration took hold, uh, Mr. Tatoy, a Catholic, said he turned to prayer as it gave him strength. And then he began to sleep a heck of a lot, you know, as you would uh, imagine, uh, low on food and water and so forth. Then he woke up in the afternoon uh, to the sound of a scratch of scratching and looked overboard to see a six-foot shark circling the boat and repeatedly bumping the hull. And then when the shark had his attention, he said, it just swam off. And he claims it was getting his attention because when he looked up, there was a fishing boat, the stern of a ship, and he could see crew with binoculars looking at him. And uh, they took him aboard. And, of course, uh, it all ended well, except for uh, the the brother-in-law who passed away. But here he is claiming that the six-foot shark was responsible for rescuing him. Maybe a bit of a a stretch there. Uh, But, again, I've posted that and many other stories at richardserrett.com. Have a look. All right. uh, Settle in because uh, you're going to, for those of you, uh, and I'm guessing many of you, 
fans of uh, Jim Morrison, uh, the uh, the front man for the Doors, one of the great poets. And um, I'm not sure, I, I had the impression, and, and uh, my guest is going to set us straight here in a few moments, how he felt about the music and uh, whether at times he maybe would have preferred just to be, uh, you know, to lead the quiet, romantic life of a poet rather than have one of these, some of these wonderful words set to music and, and uh, have to endure the, uh, the fame and, and all the trappings that go in, uh, along with the, the rock and roll lifestyle. Uh, but, uh, I'm a great admirer of Jim Morrison's and I'm a delight, I'm delighted to have with us a part of the inner circle of the Morrison family. He was married to Jim Morrison's sister, Anne, and as a member of the Morrison family, he was privy to information that the outside world could only guess about. Alan Graham served as a consulate, a consultant rather, to uh, Oliver Stone's film *The Doors*, and he is the author of *I Remember Jim Morrison*, which is an intimate portrait of Jim Morrison's character and the forces which shaped his life and death. Alan Graham, welcome to the Conspiracy Show. Good to have you with us. Thank you, young man, for having me. Uh, now, I know you grew up in Liverpool, just a stone's throw from the famed uh, uh, cavern where the Beatles and the zombies uh, got their start. Uh, but how did you uh, come to meet uh, Jim's sister, Anna? Well, I was living in London in 1966, and I met her through another American girlfriend of hers. And uh, at that time, her father was... Captain Morrison, who was about to be Admiral Morrison, she was stationed at the Navy Building in London. This was at the height of the Vietnam War. That's when I first met her. And uh, when did you? When did then you? Did you go on to meet the family and 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 later the the, the young Jim Morrison? Well, a few weeks later, I met her brother Andy, who came on the tube station to Earl's Court to meet, to you know meet me. And I first met him, and then a few weeks after that, I finally met the father and the mother. Went to the house and had dinner, met them, and they were very, very conservative, ultra right-wing military family, as you would expect. Sure, yes. And I was a kid from Liverpool, but still had a Liverpool accent. I kind of talked like that through my teeth when I first met them. You know what I mean? Right, Sound, right. Sounded like one of the Beatles. <laughs> And uh, then he left. They, the family left, went back to the United States because the admiral had uh, been stationed at the Pentagon in Washington, D.C. And uh, she stayed behind with me, much to the dismay, uh, because she was still going to university, University of Florida, Gainesville. And uh, she decided to stay behind and work at the Navy building and postpone a career for a year and have fun in London. And, of course, we got pregnant and <laughs> very soon after that. So, they, so she was pregnant and married with me. We were living in London. <clears throat> we had no idea that Jim Morrison was Jim Morrison because he about... Well, two years earlier, he left UC, graduated from UCLA in 1965, and as, as soon as he graduated, uh, he disappeared. I, um, well, he actually, his, he wrote to his father and told him that he graduated and had got this lovely degree in cinema and fine arts, and that he, uh, he was, didn't want to pursue that. He, he was going to be a musician. And, of course, he was disowned, and they sent the the draft board after him because he was eligible to, you know, that's what his father threatened to do to him if he did do this, that he was uh, now eligible for the draft and that the draft board would be visiting him soon. So he went underground. He lived on a rooftop in Venice, eating out of dumpsters and bumming drinks off friends and subsisting like that. <clears throat> so his father actually followed through with a threat to sick the draft board on his own flesh and blood. So, Not only that, they came to visit one day to the house, and he was just livid. If, if, did you ever see a movie called The Falcon and the Snowman? I did, indeed, yes. Yeah, well, it was that same angst, that same father and son angst. The father was so livid that he dared besmirch the Navy, his, his country, his flag, the cause, the whole, uh, his whole society uh, that he'd reject it and go into this hippie commie world. It was like... You know, so he said to the FBI, yes, you do pursue him, and this is where you might find him. 
literally he was, you know, in that punishing, like, he's got to grow up and take the man, you know, it's like, right, right. Know the father would, you know, they'd be upset, but they wouldn't send him, you know, I guess some would have, but uh, anyway, that's so, so Morrison was kind of on the run, he went to the draft board, he told him he was gayer than Florida, so they classified him unfit for duty or whatever, which enraged the Admiral even more. And so there was a never-to-be-fixed, you know, awful chasm between the father and the son, and never again see eye to eye over anything. And uh, so then Morrison disappeared, and he told everyone his parents were dead whenever, you know, he talked to anyone. Right, and he, right. Even though he was graduated from the UCLA, he was a beach bum, sitting on a beach bum and drinks, writing poetry. And that's when Mandrick walked by in the summer, late summer, and said, where have you been? And Morrison said, I've been right here on the beach writing songs. What are you doing? He said to Mandrick. And Mandrick said, I'm, I got a group. I'm not doing anything. What are you doing? Well, I'm not doing anything. So he said, well, let me come along and take a look at my group, and I'll, let's see what you can do with those songs. And that's where it started. Now, in the uh, the Oliver Stone movie, that scene on Venice Beach, uh, I, if, if memory serves, the, the 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 first poem that Jim Morrison sort of presented to Ray Manzarek was uh, Moonlight Drive. Well, first of all, can I? I'd like to discount the movie oh, utterly. I worked with Oliver Stone yes. and Val Kilmer, and yes. he made a, he made a hodgepodge. He made a uh, an awful uh, collage of Jim. You made a caricature of Jim, and it's, it, it's almost like, you know, he Oliver was in Vietnam and all of this happened, so he missed the whole scene. So when he tried to make it in Oliver's mind, he just took what he read about that experience because he wasn't here sure, sure. during that time. So he never knew, and, he, and that's the awful part of that awful tapestry, I call it, because it's got so much in it, but it's so wrong... All of it, based on a book called No One Here Gets Out Alive, which was right. first written by Jerry Hopkins, which was then <clears throat> rejected by every publisher because there was, there was something vitally missing from it, and most people don't know. If you read No One Here Gets Out Alive, the first part of it's credible because it's written by a credible journalist, uh, Jerry Hopkins, but then he g g got in league with Danny Sugarman, the mailroom clerk for The Doors, and he got all of his friends and made up stories, and they got all of these groupies. And they, got, they just made a bunch of shit up. And that's where it went off the rails. Listen, uh, Alan, I'll get you to hold on. We'll come back, and we'll get you to set the record straight. We'll find out uh, when you first uh, um, met Jim and what your impressions of him were. The real Jim Morrison from the mouth of Alan Graham, the author of I Remember Jim Morrison, his former brother-in-law. Back with more of The Conspiracy Show. Don't go away. Stay with us. Fasten your seatbelt. And put your tray in the upright position. You're about to leave everything you know behind. On The Conspiracy Show with Richard Serrett. Welcome back. Alan Graham is with us, uh, the former brother-in-law of the late Jim Morrison, a uh, legendary frontman of The Doors. Alan, w when did you meet uh, Jim for the first time, and, and what were your impressions of him? We came to California in 1968, and landed in San Diego and was staying with a friend of the Morrisons, uh, the godfather of Jim, Andy, uh, Andy Richards. Uh, Andy Morrison, Jim's younger brother, was named after Andy Richards. So he was a very close family friend. We were staying with him. And the first week, we drove up to Los Angeles to see Jim. We just drove up to, looked up the office address in, on Hollywood Santa Monica Boulevard, drove up there to see him, and before we got there, I called ahead of the office and, you know, told them we were coming, and, you know, where was Jim to be found? And they said, well, he was actually doing a concert in Houston, and he was flying in, he was being in Los Angeles Airport at 11 a.m., so we were a couple of hours away, so we just drove to the airport, and we surprised him as he got off the airplane, he hadn't seen his sister for three years, and we were waiting there with all the other, you know, passengers, and he started walking off, and the, first the doors came off, and they walked up with their bags, and Jim was the last, and he came off, and he was wearing a, a World War II bomber jacket with the big fur, you know. Right, you right. In that picture. And this was in August, by the way. <laughs> so he was, like, looked ridiculous. He was carrying this beautiful antique briefcase with all of his writings in it, and he had cool leather pants on and cowboy boots and 
lots of, you know, like Concho Silver. He looked very cool, very different, by the way, than everyone else coming through there. So we just started walking alongside him. We didn't say anything to him. And he looked down, and I was carrying my son, Dylan, who was one by then. And Anna was walking next to me, and he just looked over, and he stopped and looked at us and he said, you wouldn't happen to be my sister, would you? Oh, my. So that's the way we met him. And she said, yes, I am. This is your nephew, Dylan. That's my husband, Alan. He's from Liverpool. And we all walked to the luggage rack and got his luggage. We had rented a car, so we had a car waiting outside. And he told the doors, go on ahead, and we'll wait at the luggage rack for his luggage. And uh, Art Linkletter was a famous... TV sure, personality. Obviously. Sure. Kids say the darndest things. Right. He came barreling through the crowd, angry for some reason. He saw Jim, dirty looking hippie, he thought, and just barreled past him and nudged him over. And Morrison looked at him like, talk about rude, but there's a little background story to that and why he did that. And I'll, I'll briefly tell it to you. A year earlier, Art Link let his daughter jump off. Yes. Yeah. Okay, so he had all this hatred for hippies, and he actually blamed the Beatles because she took acid, and you know, following that whole trip. So anyone like that, he hated. So Jim looked at him and went, "Wow, I never did like that asshole." And so uh, that was got the luggage, got in the car, we drove to Hollywood, to, and we met Pamela. She was in a, uh, an apartment in Santa Monica. They lived there with a red carpet on the floor. Pamela Corson, Jim's uh, girlfriend. Right. And there's the story on Pamela real quick. A moment, we walked in. She, of course, she didn't know we were coming because Jim didn't know we were coming. We'd surprise him and he'd surprise her. And all the doors were going, oh, my God, he really does have family because they thought he, everyone was dead. No one had, you know, like uh, he told them his family was dead. So there we were in the flesh. Look, She looked just like Jim, by the way, Anna. So everyone was always gawking at her. Right. And Pam Pamela did something awfully strange. She ushered Anna into the bedroom, and from under the bed, she pulled out a long box, wooden box, and opened it up with little, you know, curiosities in it, mm -hmm. a rolled up piece of paper. Turns out to be a, an envelope that was ripped open, and on the, uh, the white side, on the inside, Jim Morrison had written his will, last will and testament. That's Interesting. That's the very first thing she showed to Anna. That's, that's bizarre. Very strange, huh? So, well, it was a precursor to a lot of strange behavior after that for what happened and ultimately, of course, what happened to Jim. So that was the very first time we met her, first weird behavior, right? And there was a lot of right. behavior like that until he died. Alan Graham is with us, former brother-in-law of the late Jim Morrison. Now, was Jim, was he, uh, as as you, the visit progressed, I mean, was he was he happy? Was he was he emotional about meeting his sister and, and his new brother-in-law and his, and his nephew? It was like... Way cool, but you could see that he was like, oh, my God. He was marveling at his nephew, and he was marveling at his sister, and he was marveling that she was married already with a baby, and it was like he was this famous rock star by now, you know. It's like, but he was gaining, and most people, you know, you saw in that movie where he went around talking like a philosopher. Well, yes. He, he did that when he was drunk with his little clique, but in real life, that wasn't, that wasn't him. He was acting, doing his drama, you know, so... But when he, around us, he couldn't do that, you understand? Sure. <laughs> we sure. could laugh at him, which he would anyway. And, and I've, so he had to, he had to alter his behavior. That was, a, that was what I'm trying to say. So, you know, this big rock star, that idol, everyone wave, uh, just bated breath on his every word, you know what I mean? What he said was what was happening, and it's like, he was Mr. Cool, but he, he had to be a little more human with us. Right, because, I mean, he had he had this public persona, and now all of a sudden he's confronted with his past that knew him before, and so he has right. to be the real Jim, and who is that? In front of those people, which was very interesting, because they all started like, oh, my God, it's like looking behind the Oz, you know, the curtain, uh, the Wizard of Oz, looking behind the curtain and seeing, my God, he's not a wizard. He's not magic. He's not from this purple glove kingdom of you know, poetry, and he's like an ordinary guy. And your first impressions, did you like him? Yeah, he was very funny. <laughs> That's what kills me about people. It's like, he was funny all the time, and you never read about that. You would never imagine that Jim Morrison was funny, would you? Because it's always like drugs and death and uh, all this 
drama. Of yeah, the morose. Movie. Yeah, the imagery Always, of death. Uh, sure. And that's why the book couldn't be published because it was morose. You know, no one would took it. Finally, it only got picked up because Francis Ford Coppola. You know, picked. It was that 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 was that music was moved in uh, used in that movie as the end. So all of the same things were happening at the same time. If things were getting famous, and it was like a fluke that that book ever become published because the Admiral was dead against it. It wasn't an authorized biography, which makes it more salacious, which makes it, you know, like tabloid people love it, and so does studios. Right. But it's crap, and it's a lie. And uh, the real Jim Morrison you will never know for these reasons. Five years' worth of Jim Morrison's life is written about only. You know, it, Jesus has got more written about him than Morrison in the end because none of his family ever spoke really in any depth. They give you a few tidbits here and there. His roommates at school or his classmates at school knew him only so much. His inner family never spoke, not one time, never. The Admiral finally gave a little interview and his sister gave a little light interview, but the inner circle of Morrison remained and will remain because they're all dying off and uh, to this day no one's ever spoken. There's no reason for them to ever speak again. But you'll never know the, uh, except for the the things that I share with you that I grew up, you know, the 25 years I was married and was in the Morrison family that I saw and that they talked about Jim growing up and that their experience and, and, my, and the essence of them, you'll find even mine is limited. You know, I don't sure. tell all of the inside of their lives and, the, and that's why they never did want to talk to anyone about it. When Jim got famous, it was like, oh my God, who <laughs> turned the lights on here? They never wanted any publicity and for the rest of their life, that's what they got, you know. And, and it, uh, when it was this and that and that, uh, all of a sudden picks up the same image. He perpetrates the same image. But the Jim we all knew and laughed our butts off with never was, uh, you know, it, you never saw that. And, you, and so you only know that little bit about Jim Morrison. See, even Bob Dylan, you know, someone as cool as Bob Dylan, he, 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 when he met Val Kilmer after he played him in that movie because it was such a, to me, it was a hideous movie. Bob Dylan said to Val Kilmer, "Hey, yeah, you you play you play that guy, that guy, you know that guy." So he, Bob Dylan was reviled by Jim Morrison's image. You know what I mean? Right, right. <laughs> and you would expect the opposite. You'd, you'd expect him to look at, but uh, but. How did Anna and 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 uh, Jim's brother Andy? I mean, did they did they miss Jim? Did they feel that he got a raw deal from his father, or because again, a very conservative family? But how did they? pursue or uh, perceive what you know the fact that Jim sort of ran off and disappeared when I met Ann Andy had just been captured from the airport by the butler for the admiral his driver I mean his chauffeur had found him at the airport he was running away trying to get back to Los Angeles to hook up with Jim that's how much he missed him and Anna spoke of him in only revered tones he was yes he was deeply loved he was deeply missed because those three grew up like water babies you know what i mean they were navy brats and they all swam and were athletic and had fun and they were suntanned and they were healthy and they were a very close little family unit which is often the case with military families they, oh, yeah. they, they oh, move yeah. around they, they don't have friends they rely that's on it. each other yeah that's right and jim and uh, she was always aware of jim you know like he was his instinct was to be like his father, Admiral, you know, was very responsible. Even when we met him, he was always making everybody got a drink, and you know, he just absolutely couldn't shake that good upbringing that it, that they gave him. The Morrisons, you know, ethical upbringing. Andy Morrison wanted to be a Green Beret when I met him. So he was, the whole family was pro-war. Even Jim was, believe it or not, it was like when he was a young man, he was just like his father. He wanted to be a interesting, war hero. interesting. And did Jim ever talk to you or Anna or Andy about? about his father did he miss his his parents when when morrison's father sent the fbi after him the door closed morrison never once ever tried to reach out to them they followed him when he got famous in fact clara drove to new york to see him play and took andy when he was just you know <laughs> 16 years old and drove him to new york and jim sat in the front seat got the manager to put her up front, and after the show went backstage, and Jim left. <laughs> she would, he wouldn't talk to her. Yeah. And then later on, about a year later, the admiral called up the hotel because Jim was in New York and picked up the phone. It was a Jim. Hello, oh, Jim, this is your dad. How are you doing? 
Uh, well, I'm doing fine. He said, well, uh, yeah, you're pretty famous now, huh? He said, yeah, I'm pretty famous. And I said, well, uh, you, you're going to come over and have dinner with us? He said, well, I'm pretty busy. And he said, well, nice to talk to you. Nice to talk to you, son. That was it. That was it. Oh, the dear. end of it. And that was Morrison <coughs> being sullen, being unforgiving, and absolutely intractable in his belief that he was right. And you could hear it in the Admiral's voice. Yeah, well, that's, I got my side, you got yours. It's like, we don't see eye to eye. And there's, there's a great song called In the Living Years by Mike and the Mechanics, a British group. Yes. And it's like, it's that terrible angst between the father and the son, because the father <coughs> was succeeded by the son, superseded, because he made $10,000 a night. That was back then, and his tax bracket was big business, and the Admiral made $35,000 a year. And that was it back then. So he was famous, but it's like you can never... To the Admiral, that was like, yeah, but that's Hollywood money. That was, you can't make that much in one night. Yeah, that was it. it was just... And it, how, did, uh, how did Jim perceive his own fame? Was he, was he... By 1968, when you met him, they were at their height. I mean, was he tired of it? Was he um, em, em, embarrassed by it? Did he embrace it? It was like... I don't try to be blasphemous, but I'm saying like... It, when he was like a Jesus figure to the hippies and they laid palms before his feet on Sunset Boulevard one year, next year, he was a pervert. So he was cast down into this, he was from this magnificent role as this rock idol to this pervert because he pulled his schlong out on the stage, or allegedly. In Miami, right. Yeah, and so he walked around. And I wrote a part of my book, it's called A Rat's Maze, and it was this. He lived in a tiny awful motel called Alta Cienega on Santa Monica and La Cienega Boulevard. Across the street was the door's office. Down the street was a boutique of Pamela's. Around the corner from that, in the same block, there was a little tiny office called Highway Productions where he made his films. Across the street from that was Electra Studios. And the next, to complete the circle in a rat's maze in the four square, was a bar that he hung out in. So he, he lived his life in this, and the reason he lived in this rat's maze and walked around like a rat, drinking and dying and creating, but failing too, the boutiques started suddenly collapsing, too much money wasted on that. Pamela's little game, the film studio, it was his own little thing was draining him, everybody wanted money. He was in trouble in Miami. The lawyers wanted him. The doors were fighting with him. So he was walking around in this rat's maze. And one heaviest of all burden that he carried was the fact that Pamela was bisexual, or worse, and a heroin addict. And he was constantly leaving her and going to that motel. And instead of going home at night and doing the rest of the things in a normal he would go to the motel, and they would go to the work. And then he would drink, and he would get depressed, and he would drink some more, and he would go in the studio. A vicious and, cycle. Uh, Alan, got to take a time out. Let me, uh, you stay where you are, we'll come back and we'll delve further. The Rock Real Jim Morrison from uh, Alan Graham. Back with more of The Conspiracy Show. Stay with us. You want the truth? You can handle the truth. The Conspiracy Show with Richard Serrett. Welcome back. Alan Graham, part of the inner circle of the Morrison family, was married to Jim Morrison's sister, Anna, uh, until 1986. Now, uh, Alan, were you a fan of the music? Uh, what, did, what did you think of the Doors and, and uh, the, the, the poet, the, the poetry of, of Jim Morrison? To be a fan because it was unique music, but he was also drawing on, you know, uh, syncopated jazz of the 1920s with Alabama song. That was Bertolt Breck and the Three Penny Opera, but he also loved, you know, well, that's where Mac the Knife came from, the original Mac sure, the Knife. And sure, he, 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 uh That whole, um, his, his influence of William Blake, of course, his yes. poetry, but, it, but, but Stravinsky and a lot of other classical artists were in Morrison's lexicon. People don't know that, but uh, he grew up, his father grew up playing the piano in that kid's ear, and his grandmother before him. There, he could sing a long time ago, and so could his all of his family and play instruments. So he can it, it, It's kind of like it was. It was easy thing for him to do. But he, but out of all of that, he came up with a very unique style, and it was very easy because, like, I was just listening to, you know, um, the end, the album today. Since I knew I was going on the end, I, I was. 
to me, it's timeless. The music hasn't died, and so it's, it was to me, it's still cool. And I'm almost seventy, you know, so and, and it lasted that long. So, and what what was your? I mean, you mentioned this vicious cycle he was in, this rat's maze, and being, you know, he had these hangers on, and and uh, I guess you know, maybe you would consider Pamela to be one of them that was sort of draining yeah. him. What, but what about the other members of the band, uh, Bobby Krieger and Ray Manzarek, and yeah. what were your impressions okay. of them? They were wholly separate people from Jim. First of all, they all came from a Maharishi meditation lifestyle. Robbie and Ray were two devotees of the Maharishi Mahi Yogi and did everything. Their whole life was... Ray thought he was reincarnation of Buddha, so he had his own world going on. And Morrison had his own ego. He was, a you know, an intellectual, dynamic, good-looking guy, but totally different people. They didn't drink. <laughs> they weren't boozers like him. He was a Morrison was a young man. He was a heavy boozer from a child, believe it or not. Uh, he grew up in a Navy family. You know, around every single night, Navy folk would be at the house at 5, 8, 5 p.m. until 7 p.m. getting bombed. Cocktail hour. Mm. Every single night. Sunday, I think they took off. Or it was a little Sunday afternoon thing, but it was a whole ritual of alcohol. So Jim, grew in, growing up, would have seen lots of half drinks laying around the house when people were half drunk and leaving and falling asleep, and he would drink them. So he was an ACA, Alcoholic Child of America, from when he was maybe 10. Oh, dear. So a lot of people don't know that. And, but was he close with the other band members, or was it strictly a business they arrangement? Absolutely I would say Densmore loathed him beyond compare, and uh, the others were like you know, disappointed as the as uh, Sid Vicious's band was disappointed with him because he was always passing out and doing something radical, and it's like it's like a hyperactive person. Oh, no, I don't mean a I mean a manic depressive person who goes on these high rolls, does all this wild stuff. Some good comes out of it, but a lot of bad comes out of it too. And for diligent, hardworking, studious. People like Ray Manzrick, Krieger, and the other, they were. <laughs> it was like, oh, my God, we've got this monster. We're making all this money, but we've got this monster. And it could all blow up at any minute, and it did. And was he difficult to work with? I mean, aside from the drinking, I mean, was he was he the, the, sort of the, the temperamental artist? No. He was, uh, in the end, you could see <laughs> he didn't want to be doing it because a lot of people were milking it. For example, Paul Rothschild was, a, as far as I'm concerned, <coughs> a little vampire. He would milk it so there were more hours, and then the, the lecturer would be charged more hours, and he would do silly, repetitive stuff, and Morrison was onto it in the end, and uh, you just don't do that many simple takes of simple stuff, you know. So you could see he was trapped in that. The producer wanted more hours, and the uh, lecturer would charge, you know, them. <laughs> so you could see it was eaten away at him. Uh, and then when he got into trouble in Miami, everyone sort of grabbed for their own stuff and said, hey, Morrison, you caused that, man. You've got to pay for that. Even though they all had a written one for all and all for one contract, and, and that was Morrison's idea. He wrote most of the music that most people don't know, but he decided in this, this semi-socialistic, hippie, bohemian way that there were no bosses. We're, you know, we're all hippies. We're all equal. We're all, you know, one. And so he decided that it would be the words of music by the doors. Even though Manzrick didn't write, Craig wrote a couple of songs, three or four, I think, throughout the whole career. Densmore was the little drummer boy only. And so mostly all of that stuff came out of Jim's head, and the music came out of Jim's head, and he would sit and instruct Krieger and Mandrick which chords, and they would then build around. He didn't even know which chords until they told him what they were, but he, he heard them in his head. So he was the influence in that music, and he was the heart and soul of that band. And when he died, that band died, if you'll notice. They never again had another record. They never again reached the fame. And they, uh, I call it the Morrison Curse. You know, they've done it in many many ways but they'll never capture that magic and never and if they, that didn't stop them trying even no stop for sure Ray Al, from singing either alan take a, we'll take a, another time out we'll come back and uh, we'll find out um, uh, what happened in uh, in paris in july right. of 1971 alan graham 
is the author of I Remember Jim Morrison. And uh, we'll also talk a little bit about his film project, The Great Jim Morrison Baby Scam. Back with more of The Conspiracy Show. Stay with us. The truth will set you free. But first, it'll really tick you off. You're listening to The Conspiracy Show with Richard Serrett. Welcome back. Alan Graham stays with us for a few moments uh, yet. Uh, the author of I Remember Jim Morrison, and Alan is uh, the former brother-in-law of the late uh, Jim Morrison. Uh, Alan, so much has been uh, written, so many uh, legends surrounding Jim's untimely death at the age of 27 in Paris. Uh, have you been able to piece together what you think really happened? Yeah, as far as I was concerned, he was either left for dead or to try to revive him and couldn't and just then covered it up by pretending he died in the bathtub and I'll tell you why I think that on July 4th in the evening I got a phone call from the commander Richard saying there's some news coming in from Paris that says Jim's dead and I said oh yeah another one because we'd heard many of them and by God I checked the radio station and he had died the day before July 3rd which would make it Paris, you know, eight hours later, so actually we didn't find out that he was dead until the third day or two and a half days later. And Pamela didn't call us, and instead of reporting to the authorities who he was, she tried to cover it up. Some say that was so they, you know, they didn't want a circus around his name, but she didn't, not, not only did she try to cover it up, but she was then went to the American embassy to report him dead, because that was what you had to do with an American citizen, and they referred her to the, to the Navy because Jim Morrison was, you know, uh, a Navy dependent. Of the, 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 she told him that he was nobody famous, and that he uh, it was just her boyfriend, and he died, and she buried him, and had him uh, no autopsy, and buried him, just like that. So they said, well, we've got to check this out and find a family and la, 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 la. Anyway, so she was supposed to come back to the uh, authorities with his passport, birth certificate, and all those things, and she left for Los Angeles. She went directly to Max Fink, Jim's lawyer, and told him that she had been taking heroin, snorting it, and she didn't know that it was so strong because it was from Marseille which is you know almost pure sure and he, that he'd taken some and he'd passed out and she couldn't revive him and she told him that and all this terrible screaming hysterical help me you gotta help me on and on and on so that's only did I find that out several years later ten years later when Max Fink I interviewed Max Fink so I didn't know that part of it but when she came back to Los Angeles she didn't contact us we tried to contact her she just left and hid out in San Francisco and wouldn't talk to us. That was a strange thing. Never tried to contact us or tell us what happened to Jim or explain. We always thought that was weird until a few months later we heard that she was going around trying to get everyone she knew to say that Jim and her lived together for seven years. And I wonder why we wondered why. Well, that's called common law wife status. If you can prove you've lived together with someone for seven years, you get it all, just right. like a wife. So she managed to do that. She went into probate for two and a half years, and the doors were suing her, and everyone was suing her, and the Morrison stayed completely out of it. We stayed, just let it all happen. She finally gets the ruling, and she is the wife. And the doors go nuts, and the, the next morning, they find her dead. She'd overdosed on heroin the night before, and they found her with her legs up in the kitchen the next morning like a dead cockroach. So she got her just rewards. Do you, and, and do you believe that that's what happened, or do you think that she may have had a, a, more of a direct hand in his death? I think this is what happened. It was another thing I found out and didn't find out until 20 years later when they released the autopsy pictures, or not the autopsy pictures, the death scene photographs. Morrison was in the bathtub with his head on the tile laid over to one side, a little bit of blood coming out of his nose, and the water was cold, been there for hours. But did you ever see anyone who get in the bathtub themselves, like she claimed he was feeling too good, so he went and took a bath in the night, 
Did you ever see anyone get in a bath and put their head against the faucets where you turn the water on and off? No, absolutely not. It's That's the other way where around. Head was exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So to me, that was a very good clue that she and plus her behavior. Clara Morrison, Jim's mother, went to a grave believing she had something to do with it, and I will do the same thing, and so will everyone else we know. But I will let me give you a hockey game analogy. If this was a hockey game, she would have been a, an a, awarded an, an assist. In the very least. Right, right. Now, but but did, did Jim? I know he was a a drinker, a heavy drinker. Oh yeah. But did was he into drugs? I mean, I always thought not. Well, he, you know, like everyone else in his youth, in his youth, he died when he was twenty-seven. When he was eighteen, nineteen, and twenty and twenty-one, he took everything, and he bought Los Angeles, San Francisco, and New York City a drink at the same moment. So he took everything, did everything, and. He was just that Jack Kerouac. Everybody got to get a drink and get high with me. So that's the way he was. But soon he tapered off, not liking drugs, not liking smoking hash or doing coke or doing acid or any of that childish stuff. He got into be a real heavy third degree drinker, man. He was stage three all the way. So then why would he have been dabbling with Pam's heroin? I think this is what happened. She was a Oh, I can't tell you. Anyway, broke his heart. That's why he was always roaming around from in the rat's maze because he would always find her doing some heroin or do it with somebody or something. And, you know, it's like very sad. That broke his heart, that. And, uh, but, well, I'm sorry. What was the, what was the question again? Well, uh, it, why, if he, if he had an aversion later in life to oh, drugs, yeah, yeah. He why would... needles. He would never have touched needles. We knew that. But, but it's easy, you know, you go out to the club and you... He would have snorted it, not knowing, or thought it was coke or something, done it, you know, drunk. Because by that time, he was completely wet-brained, drunk, drunk all day. He hardly knew what was happening most of the time. And if, he would wake up sober for a few hours, but a couple of drinks, and he was blind drunk again. So he really didn't know what was happening. Now, there's talk that she wasn't even there. She came home and found him in the middle of, in the, middle of the night in the bed and with the, with the junkie, the count that she was with, and that they put him in a bathtub and it, Marianne Faithful was very much involved in it, too. She was called over to the house, and I think she had something to do with putting him in the bathtub. But the, the buffoons all put him in wrong, so they left us that clue. How did Pamela manage to get a French medical examiner to sign off oh, on his death? Oh, God, tell me about that one. Tell me about that one. That no was autopsy. Born, no autopsy. paid for, yeah. It's just like anything back then. You could buy anything. And he was bought and paid for, as far as I'm concerned. And uh, it was just all too quick. It was all too, you know, like, he's dead, he's buried, there's no autopsy. And listen to this, he dies on the weekend, so they've got to keep him in the bathtub on the dry ice all weekend, right, till Monday. By then, she's got a ticket for Los Angeles. And she's buried him and left the same day. My word. That. And why was the casket sealed? Why did no one... Ah, yeah, that's the other thing. There was a talk that there was a Jim Morrison lookalike, name is Verna or someone like that, and that he would always hang around with Jim and they would mistake him because they both had long hair and beard, and sometimes he would be sitting drinking with Jim and would have slept at Jim's apartment and borrowed Jim's shirt or his pants or even a hat one time, and then I heard rumors later that this guy would show up, so yeah, I'm Jim Morrison, you know, and they would give him drinks not knowing that it was... <laughs> so <laughs> maybe that's what happened. Maybe Jim finally saw a way to get up and put Werner in the box, and that's who it was, and that's why it was all sealed. And maybe it was like uh, she was supposed to meet Jim later with the money, but she didn't, and maybe something happened to her. Who knows? You, you, I mean, you think that's a distinct possibility? It was Jim's Any, lookalike. You know what? With Jim Morrison, <laughs> I would anything is possible, including th including the possibility he faked well, his own death. As long as there's a human alive, and there's corruption, and there's like intrigue, it's 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 the story of man, isn't it? But did he? You know, it's we have these legends that he talked about. You know, faking his death and yeah, and um, uh, wanted to drop out and maybe yeah. move to Africa. Do you think that's possible? Yeah. Well, as I say, with him, yeah, I, I would say absolutely. I mean, it's like 
when people say well, we're the only thing on you know the only live planet in the universe, what absolute you know <laughs> with all that out there, there's got to be something, and that's the way I think. If the possibility with Morrison and a movie of the week of that kind of story, yes, I do. <laughs> Bait and place with palm trees. Uh, Alan, uh, I, I know that um, you're working on a film project entitled The Great Jim Morrison Baby Scam, and we do have periodically these people popping up and claiming that they are the uh, the, the progeny of uh, of Jim Morrison. And uh, um, Tell me a little bit about that project. We just have a few moments here. Yeah, well, there's not only him. There's several guys who have been always trying to pretend, or girls. There's a woman in Portugal <laughs> who claims she's Jim Morrison reincarnated. And she actually dressed herself up like him and sings on the Internet. Her name is Maria. She's out there. But there's one guy, Cliff Morrison, he just finally got 10 years. Uh, but he's been going around for about 20 years pretending that he's the son of Jim Morrison. He's made a bunch of albums. He's taken a bunch of investors. And there's a whole underground of people believing this guy is Jim Morrison's son. But it never got famous because he's always, they've always kept it, you know, low. But they've taken a lot of people for a lot of money, and uh, each time they do it, this guy gets on heroin, and he collapses, and the whole thing, and they go get a new producer, and a new scam, and it's like they've been doing it on and on and on and on. And finally, they got this guy for trying to rob a 7-Eleven with a toy gun, and now he's serving 10 years uh, in... Going to, he's going to uh, California prison anyway for 10 years. And, uh, it was a whole gang. His mother was involved. There was a whole gang of them involved, a, a, a grift of family. So if you ever hear of a, a guy saying he's Jim Morrison's son and playing music that sounds like Jim, that's a scam. Not to discount the possibility, I'm guessing that there may be some of Jim's uh, children out there that he didn't know about, or yeah. what, do you, what are your thoughts on that? One thing you should know about Morrison, A, he was impotent. Oh, could not produce children. That's why we know. Interesting. Interesting. Yeah. Alan, you have uh, really shed some um, some uh, light here. Uh, I'm learning things about Jim Morrison. I had no idea, and, and I know my listeners are as well. I'd love to have you back at some point and uh, explore further if you'd be good for that. Yeah, it was a pleasure talking with you, young man. Thank you very much. Okay, and again, the book is I Remember Jim Morrison. How can people get the book, Alan? I remember Jim Morrison.com. Terrific. And I know the proceeds are going to a very good cause. Thank you very much, young man. I appreciate it very much. All right, Alan. Hope to talk again. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. All right. You can follow me on Twitter, twitter.com forward slash richardserrett.com and the website richardserrett.com to find out what's coming up on the show.